So I've been meaning for a while to go into an MCHEM report in detail and look at it almost like in a sentence level and say what I think about it and provide a bit of feedback. And that raises the obvious question about whose report do I pick? There's probably one of a of, of a dozen or hundreds even students that I've seen in the last few years that I could dive into and go to town on. Um, so I thought the fairest way to actually start that would be to do this one here. Um, it's a bit old, it was written in 2008, uh, and it's mine. So this is my MCHEM report from over a decade ago. So we're going to go into this. What do I think it does well? What do I think it could improve on? And generally, what would I be thinking of and looking for if I was marking this today as a piece of work submitted to me? It's long ago enough that I've forgotten a lot of it, so some of it was still news to me, and I'm... I can pick up on what I wrote well and what's really communicated well and what really needs an improvement. So if I was marking this, what would I first look? Well, let's let's zoom out and look at it. Look at the whole thing. Um, well, this is 66 pages, 65, 66 pages. That's quite a sizable document. It's probably about right for an MCHEM, I think. You don't want to be going much bigger than that you certainly don't want to be hitting 100 pages that's that's, that's a lot uh, and that's mostly because what you can see at the end here there's four or five there's there's nearly a dozen uh pages of just data spectroscopic data summaries at the end and another eight pages of appendices and technical detail at the end and what you can also see is there's a lot of figures on here there's every every page pretty much I think there's only a few handful of pages at most um, that don't have some kind of image on or some kind of figure. So this is a very well illustrated report uh, and it breaks up the text a lot. So I think that's something that when I've marked reports in the last few years, a lot of students fall down on you. You all like to throw massive walls of text at these things. Don't do that. Just break it up with figures, you know, you know some kind of cliche like a picture is worth a thousand words think about that kind of thing so this might be on the verge of being over illustrated i do go th through a lot of structures and spend some time describing them uh what you need to do and what what is appropriate for your project is is entirely up to you but i would say you know use some figures you use them this goes up to 28 and i've seen people try to get away with three in an mcm and i think three is a bit low you want to at least get 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 into the dozen so figures so let's go back in and before we read the abstract the other thing to note uh, before we start is this is assembled manually uh, and what I mean is that this table of contents is free typed all of these dots here are dots that I've added in myself some of them have been turned into ellipsis characters um, and they don't match up and it's quite a raggedy right hand edge and this was retyped and changed in the last few minutes before it was printed off and submitted. Um, I can't recommend doing that at all. Just don't. Just learn how to use the software properly. You want to be using these headings. Uh, you want to be using your caption references and cross references. And then finally, insert the table of contents at the end using the software. Uh, the same goes for the references as well. These references were free typed and you can see a couple of um, inconsistencies like this has a DOI number for some reason when the rest don't. Uh, some use abbreviations, some don't. Um, the format is reasonably consistent. I tried to get this, put the air at the end, but I don't know whose format that is. It's not the RSC format. Um, but if you use citation management software, you don't need to worry about that. It will do it for you. And if you're using citation management software, it's really easy just to add the references and let the software deal with the numbering at the end. And what we'll see as we go through this is that the citation's a little bit inconsistent. Some of it's used, but not where it should be. Uh, and if this was done with citation management software, it would be a lot more efficient uh, to do that. So let's dive in. Right, so the abstract, um, these rhodium compounds are reacted with pH2 to observe multiple rhodium dimers via NMR spectroscopy in concentrations usually below the threshold of NMR observation. Uh, that's fine, I think, as a starting point. It gets 
it really gets to the point of what is happening. We've got some compounds, we react them with hydrogen, and we see multiple dimers found uh, via NMR spectroscopy. And this is interesting because it's in concentrations usually below the threshold of observation. That that's that's pretty much it. We're seeing things you don't normally see via NMR. The only thing I would probably change here is stick some commas there um, because via NMR spectroscopy in concentrations. Well, what's the low concentration here? Uh, it suggested that electronic effects of phosphine and halide groups go in the rate and yield of CO loss. Uh, rate and yield of CO loss. Let's talk about this bit for a bit. Um, because I haven't established what this means. There's carbonyl on these compounds, but when does it fall off? Um, I know it's part of the mechanism. It reacts with hydrogen and then CO falls off and then uh, the dimer forms. But I'm not hinting at that mechanism in the abstract, so this doesn't really make any sense. Uh, in fact, there's a couple of points where this abstract could be expanded upon. Um, it probably needs another paragraph's worth of material. We can I zoom out. We just see that there's these two paragraphs. A report this size could probably do with, if not a third paragraph on its own, at least that much more text. It needs to explain that there's mechanism here. We want to add something like that to it. There's a mechanism CO loss needs to be added. Um, Reaction of this with pyridine produces a functional dihydride. Uh, yeah, that's on all right. That's on. What's probably not really clear is if we go back in, we then switch to a different part of the project. This was there was like two parts of this: one with the hydrogen reactions and one with photochemical reactions. And it's not immediately clear that this is a completely different thing now. It's a similar compound. Uh, and it undergoes addition of benzene via photolysis to yield two isomers, where the two products with the hydride ligand trans CO and hydride ligand trans CL were found in a ratio of three to one, respectively. Again, it's getting straight to the point. Um, now, I like writing like that. It gets to the point. You don't mess around with, oh, this is important because, um, but it does lack a little bit of context. So well, this could probably do with at least something like, um, I don't know, complexes of the type MXCLPR3 to, I'd put the subscripts in later, um, are shown to uh, act as catalysts towards, towards H2 and CH bonds, thermally and photochemically. That's a bit more of a better context statement because this is what this project's about. The first one's it's a catalyst towards H2, and the other one is a CH activation reaction. Uh, one's a thermal, and one's a photochemical one. And there's a bit more context in the abstract, and then we can we can get straight to the point. So that's all right. Uh, if we get to this one at the end, uh, now these phenyl hydride complexes thermally reductively eliminate. The activation parameters for this were determined as this. I like putting data into abstracts. Um, it is the key data that if someone's reading your report for this information, or they want it front and center, they need to know what you found. And then it says confirming to a reductive elimination. I'm not entirely sure what that even means. I think, I mean, it conf conforms to a reductive elimination, but I don't know what I've written there. Actually, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I don't know what this means. I know that the point of this experiment is to find whether it is an associative or dissociative mechanism, because that number tells you. Um, but it doesn't really give an indication there. So, I mean, it's an all right abstract. It gets to the point. It could do with um, these additions, I suppose. Uh, right now, contents, let's go down, acknowledgements. Yes, a portal reference, that dates it quite nicely. Uh, so, introduction, nuclear magnetic resonance, an overview. Um, yeah, these headings are usually quite good for structuring your document. It tells your reader what's going to happen, especially if you flick back to the table of contents. You can see how it goes through NMR, an overview of theory, parahydrogen, spin isomers, and then some chemistry. 
So, some atoms, when placed in a strong magnetic field, can absorb radio waves at particular frequencies, generating a spectrum of energies that can be used to identify the molecule under study and many of its other properties. Ah, come on. This is really common. You can proofread everything. And the first sentence has a typo in it. It's really important that you get that first sentence right, because if you do have a typo in it, that's going to give the... A, well, it's not necessarily a bad impression, but it's an impression that you may not have looked at this very well and the mark is going to be now thinking okay what other errors do i need to go out and actively search for um sometimes we don't find any in which case that first impression gets washed away quite quick but you still need to think about that when someone's going to be marking it because you, you you want to guide this person around your document and give them the impression that you know what you're doing because they are basically assessing your ability to do some science here and if that first impression is that you're a little bit incompetent, it, you need to work really hard to wash that away afterwards. So the process which causes this phenomenon, termed magnetic resonance, was later exploited to create a form of analytical spectroscopy. So this is this is a bit of history. Uh, this would be fine at the beginning of a literature review. But these first page and a half, two pages nearly, this is really basic NMR stuff. This probably shouldn't be relevant to a master's thesis. You should know this as a qualified chemist, what NMR is, where energy levels come from. The only thing that this really serves is to introduce a little bit of technical jargon um, that it's important for explaining parahydrogen because really the interesting part, the, the novel stuff, the stuff that is a master's level thing, not an uh, an undergraduate lecture thing is the limitations of NMR right here. NMR is not without its shortcomings despite its relative ease of use and almost universal applicability. So if I just said nuclear magnetic resonance instead of the acronym there, I could start the project here and I w don't think I would be losing much because a large amount of this Zeeman effect stuff doesn't come back into it. Sorry, let's go back up. But the limits of NMR do because this is where this is the new stuff. This is because we're talking about parahydrogen, and this is something that you just, is used to enhance the signals of NMR. So this is a bit of more technical detail, uh, a little bit of labeling quantum mechanics, uh, a little bit of talking about um, exchange or permutational symmetry, I forget which. Um, so this is laying out a little bit of the chemical physics involved in parahydrogen. The one thing that it probably lacks um, is any specific references to it being used in the chemical in a chemical sense. Um, so if this was a longer literature review, that would definitely have to be there. If it's just an introduction, it doesn't necessarily need to be. Um, you should probably look at whatever master's theses or dissertations have been written in your research group before to see what's the expectation. Um, I would probably expect, if this was submitted to me, more chemistry. Where has this been used? What kind of molecules have this been done by? What's the evidence that it's a useful technique to continue? And it doesn't really do that. This is just a basic explanation. And if you do my quantum course at any point, um, you'll get up to diagrams like this and labeling like this. It's So it's not the most advanced side of it. Um, it's not really until this page, page 9, that we actually start seeing some chemistry. Um, Vasquez complex, uh, that's a rhenium carbonyl a chloride diphosphine, has been known and studied for many years. It's a four corner 16 electron compound, it makes it an ideal base for a catalyst, and it has to. Uh, I know what I mean by there. It means it's like a framework complexes where you just replace the halide you replace the phosphine they catalyze things but base gets confused with base and acid so it's probably not the best term to use it's able to undergo oxidative addition with many species and bind h2 reversibly now this is interesting this is this is chemistry this is background chemistry this is not necessarily stuff that would be covered at an undergraduate level unless it's a specific example in your lecture course but it's not really telling me what the relevance of this is. Um, the project replaces iridium with rhodium, and that has slightly different reactivity, but I'm not really covering that. Um, so generally, this introduction is very, very vague. Here we go into phosphines and their inorganic significance. Um, 
it's it's still this is this is vague basic stuff this is not covering a lot of specific chemistry it's not showing that breadth of wider reading that we'd expect a master's student to have um, i fixed that by the time i went and did a phd in a very similar in a kind of the similar area my uh the intro to the thesis is a lot better it's more comprehensive there's a lot more material in it and a lot more specific examples but the mchem version lacks that it's not really showing off a lot of wider reading kind of shoot down to the references for a second um i know these are just broad overviews of magnetic resonance uh and then the basic power hydrogen, then the basic vasquez compound. Uh, oh, uh, ducket instead of ducket. Oh well. Um, so it's not showing a lot of wider reading. I'd, I'd expect that from an MCAM student. You want to show when it's been studied for many years, you want more than just one reference here. You want two or three. Uh, you want to be saying why is this well when it's four coordinate it's unsaturated it can become six coordinate and if it's 16 electron it can become 18 electron so oxidative addition um, can happen and this is not really making that connection um so it does connect it to power hydrogen a little bit but it doesn't really connect it to the rhodium stuff that's actually been done um so what this really needs to do is get more into the chemistry of it and do some more uh, specifics. So we've got a table of phosphine cone angles, and this is the this is probably a very specific thing. Relevant values are summarized in table one. Table one's on the previous page. Right, so two options. We kind of copy table one. Let's, let's just do that now. X that and put it here. So it looks further than values summarized in table one, or we take that whole thing and we put it here instead. Um, you don't want, well, you always should, if you've got these figures or tables or something, refer to them in the text. Your text is there to explain the figure and to say why it's relevant. And then you need to direct your reader to the thing you are talking about. So relevant values, uh, probably, actually, relevant values of these two parameters probably. I'll probably add that kind of thing in. Uh, and here we have relevant phosphine and cone angles and electronic factors. Uh, I'll probably expand this a little bit as well because I don't know why these are relevant. Um, phosphine, uh, something like four phosphines in this report some words to that effect make it good later um just to say why are these relevant because the list of these the paper that this comes from has oh, like a hundred in why is this why are these six relevant um this one's only relevant because it pops up in the conclusion in fact uh so still quite big oh the photochemical stuff uh, in addition to thermal reactions, metal complexes can also be activated by light. UV in light lies in the region of electronic things, also basic stuff. Transition metal complexes are known to absorb light by... Yeah, this is not very specific, is it? This is still... This is a little bit of undergraduate chemistry from photochemistry. It's not not specific enough, especially... We then say, in the following report, power hydrogen is used to examine. But we don't have... A break here we do not have a change of section so what this really needed here is uh, something like that report overview some kind of change of section to say that we've stopped talking about this we're now talking about this um, that's usually I think a big thing I see in a lot of introduction to lab reports and it still holds on to uh, masters and bachelor's theses this sudden skip to talking about oh in this report well, this is what i'm going to do usually comes unannounced and you end up skipping over from let's talk about my literature review to the report and the jump isn't really indicated so in the following report power hydrogen seems to examine hydrogenation reactions in rhodium complexes yeah 
The phosphine ligands altered, which ones have not previously been studied. Yeah, those were new at the time. Uh, and they attempt to derive a trend based on electronic austeric factors. So at least we're talking about um, the objectives here. This is the aims and objectives are laid out. It's a bit short, um, but that's fine. What probably, I mean, I mean, the thing that this does not do that now I, I've, I've got a lot more years of experience with this chemistry is it doesn't really say why these two parts of the project are linked. And it's because the HH bond and the CH bond uh, are actually very similar in a few respects. If you can catalyze the breakup of one, you can probably catalyze the breakup of the other. And if you can break this apart, you can do some really interesting chemistry. You, this is all about carbon relation. You can insert CO and I don't really cover it. Uh, it's really missing. It's definitely my, in my PhD thesis. It's not in here. Um, and that should be here because that is good chemical context. That is the rationale for doing all of this. So let's just go to the results and discussion. The literature review is all right. Um, needs more literature, but it at least introduce, introduces the basics, I suppose. So results and discussion. So one thing I definitely see in lab reports, and it does hold on into dissertations, unfortunately, is people will write results and just paste in their data, like data tables and images and spectra, and just throw everything at it. And it makes no sense. It's impossible to make heads or tails of. Because remember, if I'm reading this, I'm not the expert in the project. I don't know what happened. Uh, if you're doing it for science, your reader it, reading a paper doesn't know what happened either. They're there to learn. Um, so you need to really guide your reader around what's happening. So instead of just dumping your results into a big table and just leaving it at that, you should discuss what happens. So what happens here, and I think, okay, I'm biased because this is the way I was taught to write, but I think it works really well, is that we actually reintroduce what's going to happen. So rhodium analogues of vascous complex and related compounds of that type uh, are coordinately saturated 16 electron compounds. Uh, kind of repeating what I said previously, but okay, that's fine. These rhodium compounds were previously thought not to undergo oxidative addition. However, using the power of hydrogen, we can show that it does. Right, so that's what's going to happen. Uh, and then we describe the experiment that actually happened. When a solution of this one in benzene D6 is 1 to 343, uh, two hydride resonances are seen with significant intensity corresponding to structure two. Now, I don't have a structure of one and two really close by. That's probably a downside to this. That should be a lot closer. Uh, so initially, these signals are observed at high temperatures, but on degassing, we can get it at 333.295. This indicates that in order for H2 exchange to occur and the product to form and be easily observed, higher temperatures are required. So actually, I think this sort of sentence is the kind of structure that you should really think about when you're writing these. We are starting with what we did, and then we go into what we saw, and then we go into a little bit about how we then reacted to that when we saw that result and then a little bit of a comment on what it means so remember this is results and discussion so we're going to show results and talk a little bit about them as well so a little bit of commentary on your results as they appear is usually a good idea uh, this could probably do with a little bit of expansion like why do i think that high temperatures are required why? So I would think we need to add a little bit of why that would be the case. Do we think it's an activation energy thing? Uh, is it something to do with the degassing change in the equilibrium by taking out some of the gases from the solution? Uh, something like that. So each of the hydride resins display antiphase character confirming that they come from pyrohydrogen. Yeah, that's at least a quick test that it works. Uh, then I'm saying that at 333, most, 333 Kelvin, where most of these experiments are carried out, I'm quoting all the subsequent chemical shifts there. Um, so at least I'm trying to establish that I'm going to be consistent with the temperature because these experiments are all done at different temperatures, but we're going to report them for the one that was done only at 333. 
Okay, that's fine. <clears throat> um, and these highly negative chemical shifts in comparison to the alkyl region indicate they are hydride ligands, trans to Cl, and hydrides are trans to Cl are expected to be further downfield. Um, here is another good thing. You should cite this kind of statement. I, the, this, I, I, I know because I've already read this a while uh, yesterday. Um, this does start citing some papers to back up statements like this, but not consistently. And that's what I would kind of expect uh, when you're moving into a master's level. You need to contextualize all of the results that you say with respect to the previous literature. You're going to be leaning on previous literature to say uh, to, to say that these results mean that. So you need to cite it at the right point. So stick your citations in as frequently as you can. Um, and I need a reference for why that is true. So in the corresponding uh, spectrum shown in figure four, these resonances simplify greatly. I, I like this spectrum, it's one of my favorite ones. It's just, just really quite clean. Uh, and the way that it simplifies in the phosphorus to cup, uh, in the, uh, in the no, it's phosphorus decoupled, isn't it? Yeah. When you decouple the phosphorus um, resonances, you just see hydrogen interacting with rhodium, and it's really nice and clear what's going on. And this kind of describes it. But I'm still not. Yeah, here we are. Figure five of the. Um, it is where the structures of these two molecules are. The, the number two and three. Um, so if we come up to here, um, corresponding to two. I would probably expect at some point here, see figure five, something like that. Something like that. I would add in that kind of thing just to direct people down. You can even, if you are doing cross references, you can do figure five, page 13. We'll put that in with cross references so that you don't need to update it. Uh, so let's have a look at this figure in detail. And this is again, let's let's talk about the figure caption here. So something like this, I'll just put only this on, on the screen, um, needs to stand on its own. If you cut it out, you need to make sense of it. And what we can see here is you can make a bit of sense of it. Um, because the expansion of the high field region of the proton NMR spectrum of 1 in C6D6 upon addition of three atmospheres of power hydrogen at 333 Kelvin. That's all the detail that you really need. It is what it is. It's uh, where it came from. It's why we're doing it, really. <clears throat> B, uh, the, proton, uh, the phosphorus decoupled spectrum at 3 c 3 uh, I'd probably say of the same words to that effect because that still could be potentially ambiguous because um, of the same spectrum we've just decoupled phosphorus from the NMR to simplify it uh, and yeah that's that's a really nice way of doing figures as well you really you need to get away from a graph to show and you need to get away from my spectra of uh, and get into a bit more detail what were the conditions? What's the solvent? Kind of this needs to be readable on its own. So let's uh, zoom back out a little bit and go down. And we're talking about the additional resonances and we get the structures. Maybe that could have been done a bit further up, closer to where we're talking to, talking about this. Um, see, it's not, it's figure five, page 14, see? Always put those in with cross references. Um, <clears throat> so how you sequence your information can actually be quite challenging. Do you need to put this earlier? Um, because if you put it too early, I'll sh let's, let's cut that out and put it. Um, and show figure five. Well, it would then become figure four again, do it. Do it with the software, not manually. Um, there wouldn't be an indication of why we think this structure is true. Um, but if we put it at the end, it's like building up like a murder mystery, which is not entirely how science should operate. We should 
be able to you know give the game away a bit too early so how you sequence it is kind of up to you but don't make it like a complete mystery uh that you then reveal the um the identity of the killer at the end or whatever um but also back up anything you say like if you're going to put this a little bit earlier you can say these structures are actually let's put it there let's let's pretend this is still figure five uh, let, let, let's add what, what would i add here i would say um the structures were predicted by the spectra described below from figures well technically it's figure four to about six or something like that because it's a few um bits of spectra um so we could give like a little mini abstract of why this is the case um Well, I think I was including a 13 seal living experiment described on page whichever one it is. We could add in something that looks a bit like that. Kind of, um, it stops it being as confusing if we know where we're going. Of course, we then we have a bit of a knock-on effect that you need to reformat but okay never mind we, you can deal with that later uh what you can probably see from these paragraphs is they're quite technically dense uh it's something that you, you can see just by staring at the paragraph you can see there's a lot of equals and numbers in there uh, there's a lot of um elements and labels you can see that this is not just endless paragraphs of words there's data in there so to uh, better characterize these. Now, I would probably at this point then just say there needs to be another heading, like some kind of further experiments. Something, something like that. again, because I haven't, I've set this up manually. I'd have to figure out what that number is, and that number would be section two, 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 one. Two one two. Um, again, put it in with the headings. Come on. I figured this one out like m a few months after I submitted that, uh, and it helps showing us that we've done some more characterization, and then a proposed mechanism. Uh, right, quick comment on this as a style. I don't know why I chose this serif font and quite chunky bold elements because um, it doesn't look great I will probably wouldn't do this now because um, you see it, it is quite big and these arrows are getting bunched together and there's really no room for you to really make heads or tails of this this mechanism uh, it's all quite cramped so I wouldn't necessarily use that style uh, in chemdraw so if you are going to do a chemistry thesis and you're using a lot of chemdraw Use the style sheets within ChemDraw as well. You can actually set it to settings set by particular journals. Pick one that's appropriate for your area and stick with it consistently. Um, I don't necessarily like the style of this anymore with the bold text and serif, but it is consistent. All the structures are very similarly sized. We go up to here where this one was. Right, they're similarly sized. They're all consistent. Um, that's That's good. The consistency on the figures here is good and that's because i've made them myself rather than trying desperately to screenshot papers or grab them from wikipedia or wherever um and that's really really important have as much control over your figures as possible for that consistency that makes it look really good and really readable and anyone who is trying to make heads tails of it doesn't need to then translate it into a different style if if all these styles are very different across your document it actually becomes really difficult to read the consistency is key uh and then we talk about the pyridine one i actually forgot i even did this until i reread it and i've got a, a mechanism um but i don't i think this mechanism should probably be a bit higher higher up in the the order here because actually hang on let's have a look i don't refer to 
yeah, there it is. Scheme 2, but Scheme 2 comes after I've referred to it. So I will probably make some reference to Scheme 2 before that figure. It probably comes in the right, in the right place. Um, but, but I'd probably stick a reference to it. So undergoing exchange on the NMR timescale above 255. Yeah. I will probably see yes, yes, see scheme to that kind of thing there. That would be good. That comes before this. Um, and then it possibly means that this becomes a little bit redundant. Have I said the same thing effectively twice? Maybe. So it's all right. What the th the thing that's actually um, there? We go. We've got an actual citation there. It's, it's hiding. Um, so this is trying to say that we are saying that it's very similar to those reported previously for a similar reaction. Um, here's the question: Do you put that reported previously there, or can you put reported previously and put the citation there? I would probably say do it as early as possible to indicate that you are citing other people's work. If you start talking about a load of stuff and then you put the little superscript number at the end of the paragraph, say if we put it uh, here, um, it's not immediately clear that you are citing someone else's work. So if you put it close to where you're saying reported previously, please see that paper. Um, and just go exchange at higher temperatures. Maybe I'll stick a lot, a few other citations here to say that you know, there's this is quite traditional to see in, in NMR, at least it's conventional to see it. If there's this exchange going on, uh, the signals behave like that. There are a few other citations you could add to prove that, but again, that's again a comment about integrating the literature. Uh, into your report. It's the contextualization. Um, I make it specific on the mark scheme that I'm currently running um, that you should contextualize your results. This is what it's referring to. Make sure you put citations in there and that you're referring back to that literature. Um, it's not just for your introduction in your literature review. You do, you do not do your literature review and then forget about it. You go searching on Web of Knowledge or Web of Science or whatever and you throw more at this. You've got to back up these statements, and this does it very inconsistently. I think it it does it more than a bad report does, but it doesn't do it as often as a really good report does. It's probably why I would drag this into the two one region instead of the first class region. Right. A sample of five was prepared in D six benzene and warmed to three three three. Um, one thing that's I I think. When you're using numbering schemes for your compounds, it can sometimes help to at least prep your reader with uh, a list of structures and abbreviations first so that they are um, readily available. If you've got a printed version, you print this off in A3 and they fold out so you can always refer to it as you flip through. And that's actually a good system. But with an online submission in 2020 something, uh, you couldn't do that. <laughs> you will want to instead put it on the first page or in an appendix, just so we know what the numbers are referring to. So oh, this was an interesting result because uh, isopropyl phosphine is so electropositive, this doesn't need power hydrogen enhancement, it just reacts with um, hydrogen. But that also tells us something about the structure. So this talks a little bit about why we think the structures are what they are does it all right i suppose it goes through some of the evidence these data indicate two symmetrical products uh, with rhodium fragments present as proposed structures are shown in figure 11. Um, so these are proposed based on the fact that they are symmetrical i could probably put a little bit more logic in there um, they sh and check the electron counting as well um, so now yeah, here we go. This is probably it suggests six is produced by a further CO loss. Uh, why CO loss? Well, the P, uh, the phosphine isopropyl group that should be a three there, shouldn't it? 
uh, that's a little bit ambiguous. This group is highly electropositive, donating strongly into the rhodium d uh, x squared minus y squared orbital um, and strengthening the rhodium p bond, therefore making CO loss a dominant mechanism. That's actually quite good. That's talking about a bit of chemical physics is getting into a reason, but it's I think it's one of the few times where this report really gets into a good kind of chemical physics reason for why this is happening, and it is a basically a chemical physics paper, although it's on on inorganic um, compounds. Uh, and so there should really be more stuff like this. Like there should be more of the basic chemistry being discussed. There should be some more talk about that back bonding between the metal and CO and whether it's weaker or stronger and what um, what these ligands are actually doing in terms of molecular orbitals. Um, so a lot of words do get spent on recapping what went on, but not necessarily many discussing this sort of thing. There, there's, uh, if there were more statements like this, I would probably bump this up to a first class paper rather than a two one. Um, it also have to have more the, of the citations attached to it. Like for instance, uh, has that been proven before? Um, is it a back bonding thing? Is that because it's a it's a competing mechanism. Do we lose that ligand or that ligand? Has there been any work done on these phosphines before that show a difference? Uh, right. And there are a couple more figures. We're not going to spend too much time on it. Uh, I like the spectra. This 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 one's a really interesting looking signal. And uh, basically the only reason we identified a weird looking triply bridging thing this this one is because there's previous observations and i talk about previous observations don't really talk about why but i absolutely need to cite this a lot um i'm talking about duck and eisenberg which duck and eisenberg paper probably need to cite that i should probably bring the same thing down here don't be afraid of reusing the same reference in multiple places because you are still directing your reader to say i got this information from that paper which may mean you use the same number more than once, three or four times, five or six times, doesn't matter. Um, suggest these. Trans to whatever. And there, there's an pre observed previous, previous Ali. Come on. And typo. And I would probably put the citation here rather than the end of the sentence. I'd probably shift it there. Maybe there's another couple of papers on these as well. So don't forget to cite these citations should be used like punctuation. Uh, in fact, there's a 16 there. Where, where's that come from? Should that be? Because I'm saying that it's been observed previously. Well, shouldn't I put reference 16 a bit higher as well? I don't know. Oh, I see one side effect of um, doing it manually is it thinks these are all headers, even though it's blank. Um, and I've pushed this onto the next page manually rather than with a page break. So uh, you can see I'm much more competent at Word now. This is this is almost embarrassing to look through. Uh, so complexes of the type uh, rhodium halide carbonyl diphosphine, bisphosphine, are known to functionalize hydrocarbons via CH activation under UV radiation. Two citations. That statement probably could get four or five, um, they're quite well studied. These photochemical activations proceed via similar intermediates to the thermal H2 additions, however different products are eventually formed with no evidence of dimerization. So again, this is introducing the results. What is the point of this? And I, I like when dissertations do this. It's really important as a reader to know what's going on, what we expect to see, so tell us if you've got a new results section like this stick a little mini it's not quite a, an abstract but it's like a mini abstract at the beginning telling us what we're expecting to see and what's going to go on so in this section of rhodium analog of Vasquez complex uh, where we're doing dimethylphenylphosphine is investigated under photochemical conditions with benzene we don't really say why um, we're picking this one 
don't know why that linked. That, that could be a really useful statement to add um, because you should be reading this and like at the end of every sentence, a question should pop into your head. And the next sentence should answer that question. And yeah, I, I like when people write in that style. I'll usually have a question in my head. It's not like I'm I'm like intentionally thinking of one, but one will pop into my head like, oh, why is that happening? And then the next sentence answers it and poses another question. Then the next sentence answers that one. It's a really nice way of writing. Uh, and it's really kind of frustrating when that question pops into my head and I find it's not answered. And then three or four pages later, it is. Um, you really do think about your structuring here. So why that ligand? Um, okay, it's because of its cone angle and its electronic properties are intermediate compared to the previous ones. There we go. Then we could move on. Uh, again, we're getting into this whole description of what happened. A sample of nine in this was prepared for fertilizer overnight, blah, blah, blah. After radiation samples stored and stored in dry as acetone. This sounds like a lot of experimental detail that you would probably put in your own experimental section. But I think in the context of this, where we were quite studying things via NMR in kind of real time with the reaction, it's it's all right to to recap what was happening because what we did and how it's done is quite important to the result. The experimental, we'll look at the experimental in a moment. Um, it's used for something different. And again, we're refer referencing figures referencing figure 20 which was uh here we go there's hydrides we spotted um but we're not referring to figure 19 figure 19 is not referred to um so it will probably need to go here um with for producing structure shown in figure 19, probably add in something like that because that figure really does need referred to to say, well, what's the point of this? Well, this links up with that very first sentence. It's the photochemical reaction is happening here. Um, and then some phosphorus NMR. Let's let's. Let's skip all of the characterization stuff to some kinetics because this is relatively interesting. Um, so we're repeating a reductive elimination process and watching it via NMR at five different temperatures, quite low temperatures as well. It's quite interesting to do NMR at low temperature. You have to basically blast liquid nitrogen up the middle of the spectrometer and it takes a while, um, but it's, it's, it's quite fun. Uh, so the reaction scene is going to figure 24 and the method used to model the rates is described in appendix 2. Uh, actually that's quite good because there's a, I'm pointing to the appendix for the experimental data and the method and citing where the method came from at the same time. Um, I, I think that's fine. Uh, and then we get the rates and we're discussing that. And here's some modeling. And what what kind of annoyed me, I don't know how this has happened, whether it's just degraded over time, but that JPEG quality is not very good. And this pops out of Excel, so this there's, there's no excuse for me to have a, a, a figure degraded that much. You can barely read the numbers. You certainly can't. You can just about, if you squint and be very careful, see that that says time in minutes. Um, but it doesn't, it's not a very clear figure. So make sure your figures are high quality. That would probably be a couple of brownie points knocked off. Uh, and this table also looks a little bit inconsistent as well. Like these numbers have been pasted on and I haven't put the borders back in. Um, it's not, obviously not a major problem, but that's like an inattention to detail thing. Does it suggest it was rushed? And if it suggests it was rushed, is the data actually reliable or was I doing this at 2 a.m. the night before, right? And we have to think about that kind of thing. If you look like you've cared for your data, you probably cared for your data um, and it's probably more accurate and correct. A um, couple of things about this table. 
no units on the rate constants. Those should be either per minute or per second. I can't remember what the what that spreadsheet piped out. In fact, that's probably why there aren't units on there because I didn't know whether they were per second or per minute. But always, but if you're going to do something like this, like a kinetics thing, read through your lecture notes. It'll be year one physical chemistry kinetics. Everyone does it. Everyone in the world who does a chemistry degree does chemical kinetics quite early on. Go back and reread it and get the basics right. Things like the units of rate constants. Because that's not actually on there. Temperature is. Units of rate constant isn't because they're not dimensionless. Um, errors are reported as described in Appendix 2. <laughs> the trouble is those errors are actually, actually nonsense. They're some of residuals. And they're not meaningful errors. Actually, it took me a little while to figure out how to do errors in that nonlinear regression, so I'm not surprised. But again, that's something that I would be looking for if I wanted an excuse to bump this up to that first class top grade. Is that error meaningful? Has it been done correctly? And I don't think it has been in here. There was a little bit of more care and attention I needed then. I'm certainly much bigger on errors than I used to be. Um, Work on similar system fields suggested in ice summarization. Again, I'd probably stick the citation after the name uh, rather than waiting till the end of the sentence. It's a stylistic choice I prefer now. So to test this hypothesis, the second series was modeled where isomerization was likely to occur. Uh, and we got this result instead. Um, this is generally all right. I think it's 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 straightforward describing what's happening. Um, there's a little bit of inconsistency between the format of this table and that table. The borders are different sizes. I'm also suddenly switching to a sans serif font. So I don't know what the the issue is there. Um, it it feels a little bit slapdash. All right, and then determination determination of the activation parameters. Determination of. Uh, <laughs> do see this a, a lot when people try to try to make a passive voice thing um, and it reads quite awkwardly. I would probably say determining activation parameters or just activation parameters. Yeah, let's just do it. Activation parameters. That'd be of um, addition of, I don't know, six plus seven of those, the, oh, uh, 12A and 12B. There you go, it's a bit more descriptive now. Um, and then for some reason I derived the Eyring equation and I don't quite know why I need to do that. I could probably just skip straight to here and and lose this. Um, again, at master's level, it is it's sort of a, a, a choice and a balance that you need to make. Do you want to put this stuff in or not? The pros of putting stuff in like this derivation is that it proves that you understand what you're doing and it proves that you know your stuff, but it takes up words that you could be using better. Right? You don't want to, you, you could easily fill hundreds of pages of this basic stuff and then we'd get the impression of great, you learnt your lecture notes, but what's your contribution to the project then? Right? You might you might want to put a little bit of this in, but then focus on citing the literature and focus on what your experimental design was, rather than going over this um, quite basic derivation stuff. Uh, and then we get to the actual numbers. Oh, the thing is, I don't really say where these these numbers, these errors. Cause I know these are, are important errors, especially because one's huge. I don't really see where it comes from. Uh, was this back when I knew line stats or did Anna do it for me? I can't remember. Um, and it doesn't say, it doesn't really say what these are, whether they're standard errors or standard deviations or something. And then we plot the graph and you can see it's not the best straight line. I would certainly uh, recommend that you do better than that, or at least be more critical of your data of your alleged straight line looks like that. It's, it's not the best. Hmm. And then we repeat the same in the presence of CO, and this is kind of the point. 
of this experiment because if you fertilize with that catalyst and benzene in the presence of carbon monoxide um you get benzaldehyde out you do a carbon carbon bond forming reaction you functionalize benzene photochemically using just co it's very atom efficient reaction and a very energy efficient reaction um it's shown in this mechanism um and then it just kind of ends and peters out which is uh that's fine your results in discussion just just end where you the, the natural stopping point is i suppose if you want to try and get um get a final concluding statement out that ends your results in discussion on a bang sure try that but it's not most not really essential and we jump to the conclusion and i actually think this conclusion is terrible um because what i think a good conclusion should do is it should recap what you've done it should like literally it feels like it's reaching back into the previous part of the report and say on page x i did that on page y we did that and we combine those two results together uh we can we can show that this happens so let's see what this says instead Power hydrogen has played an important role in elucidating the reactivity of these rhodium compounds. That's not very specific. And what are these rhodium compounds? There's a range of them. Altering the phosphine ligand has shown massive changes in what products and form and in what ratios. That's all right, but it's not very specific. Um, altering the phosphine ligand? Well, it's not very specific about what that means. What are we altering? Well, it's the Tolman cone angle and the electronic parameter that are altering that was raised in the introduction it should make an appearance here Ligands, uh, you know, we, we, we could add in that kind of thing altering the phosphine ligands Tolman parameters okay that's a little bit better do we have a bit more conclusion about that well yeah there's a bit more when when we increase the electronic parameter enough you know that it reacts like that instead of needing power hydrogen anyway it doesn't really say it here so there's a potential for the trend between the adopter structure and the steric and electronic effects to appear out of this work if enough ligands can be studied um and then i think i said at the very end further work to confirm this would be required um he's already weird statements to make um actually things like more work needed and more study needed are banned from certain journals i think the british medical journal bans that phrase exactly because yeah. you're not being very specific to say you know do more work on it you need to be very specific about what kind of work um now to its credit this report does that the next phosphine study would be tribenzyl uh, benzyl phosphine due to its electronic factor being between these but with the much larger cone angle you know that's all right that's that's quite specific um i know the potential elements to butyl group because it's more electropositive you know this is good but we haven't actually done any conclusion the conclusion's been done in this two sentences and then i get on to future work uh and the future work section i suppose is all right it's get it's doing some things that are quite specific i've highlighted that in green because I, I like it that's that's specific that is a specific thing that we are, could do next and why we are doing it next but it doesn't really do that reaching back and recapping and every, everything uh and the photochemical one evidence presented that i summarization does not occur that's pretty solid concluding statement but i will probably reach back and say what the evidence was like evidence has been presented what evidence which evidence can with which evidence do i want um so I'd probably say the kinetic evidence and recap those numbers as well, maybe. Um, because, the, the, yeah, it's it's something to do with the errors. And it's actually, it's kind of inconclusive evidence more than anything. Um, oh, and then we did this thing. This, this, this thing we don't, I don't currently set in the projects that I run, but it was, I might after having reread this. It's a context statement. It tells you about what, 
um, you've learned or what you need to apply. So a key element of this project has been understanding NMR. Uh, basic knowledge of inorganic chemistry has been essential to understanding. Um, lol, because I don't actually do much in the way of electron counting on all the structures. I think I do, but I don't mention it. I definitely can. You have to check that each um, metal center is either 16 or 18 electron, and you have to check the oxidation states. And I don't think I really did that, um, or at least I'm not indicating that I've done that. So saturated, unsaturated, yada, 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 that kind of thing. Uh, basic and advanced laboratory skills needed in the fairly simple synthetic procedures that were employed. Okay. Some advanced in fairly simple synthetic procedures. Okay. I mean, this, this is absolutely true. You really need clean glassware to synthesize these things. Uh, you even, you even breathe in their vicinity and you'll just see nothing but phosphine oxide in your NMR spectrum. So that's it. Um, let's have a look at the experimental. So there's a lot of experimental detail in terms of what was done, but the experimental here is like a general statement about how it was went, uh, what went on. Now, depending on the type of project you are doing, this can be very, very different. If you're doing a purely synthetic project, almost all of it is experimental procedure. It's just lists of things you made. Uh, if you're doing something more analytical, uh, it will be a little bit more like I've laid it out. You'll have a general experimental at the end of how you set up your equipment and then descriptions of the individual bits and pieces that you did. So synthesis and manipulations carried out in inert conditions. Uh, the NMRs were done on those instruments. We use analytical grids. Um, solvents at all times. Yes, all of this detail is here. Um, and this is quite important to include if you want anyone to criticize your work or or replicate it, you need to be very specific about what you got. Um, because anything where it hasn't been purified, these compounds can be very sensitive um, to impurities. Um, Parahydrogen work especially, it's, it's quite interesting because you can find iridium impurities in rhodium compounds. So you can actually have a tiny bit of iridium in there. And so you get these unexplained parahydrogen signals where the hydrogen is reacting with the iridium impurity. And that must be in like the nanomolar region. Um, anyway, that's the interesting stuff. Uh, stored it at minus 30. Um, then a synthesis of this. This is the only one I synthesized. And I think the it doesn't necessarily come across in the report what I inherited from a former PhD student and what I made myself. So I made the bimethylphenyl phosphine. I inherited the triethyl phosphine uh, and used a lot of it uh, from someone else. And yeah, you know, this is a straightforward synthesis prepped. It's in the shorthand, really quick and punchy way that we write these preps. Um, the only thing I would say about this is it probably needs a mechanism or some kind of structural indication of what these dimers are like and what this final monomer is like like going from rhodium trichloride to this to this to this uh, that could probably be illustrated you could probably also stick this on one line I think this would save a bit of space if you did it this way if you've done or in or uh, organic preps before this kind of that kind of thing will be familiar to you. You build the thing you're making, and then you give the the description after it. Something like that, maybe. Photochemistry, and there's a couple of diagrams. Then the appendices, uh, all the spectroscopic data. So this is useful. Um, as someone who's marking it, I wouldn't necessarily check everything, but it is nice to see it because I'm gonna be referencing um, what are your compounds? Do you kn this? This is more an indication that you know what you are doing than anything else, because it means you're organised. You know what compounds belong to which number, and you know what spectra belong to each number. So here's the spectroscopic summary of this compound. 
and the spectroscopic summary of that one. And this just keeps going. Some of them are blank. Which one's that? Yeah, we don't get the don't get the phosphorus of that one. It's got the phosphorus of the other one, all right? Um, so this keeps going on for a while. So these are all of the compounds known. I think I treble the size of this list in my PhD thesis. Um, so table twelve, table thirteen. Oh, now one. Um, this is determining the rate constants. Uh, this one's worth pointing out because this is actually more or less copy pasted. I don't think I wrote much of this myself because it's a standard method. Um, and I'd actually like to do a, a video on how to do this in Excel at one point because it's really interesting. But at the time, I don't think I fully understood what was going on. So I just copied this in, rewrote a few bits of it. And so that would be flagged up as plagiarism if you submitted it through Turnitin these days. So I can't recommend you do that, but if it's an appendix, no one's going to care too much. It doesn't really matter too much. As long as you cite where it is and it's adapted from a, um, a particular place. Um, so that's there. Maybe it didn't need to be, but it's, it's useful to put it in there because it is a big part of the kinetics part, uh, there. And it is probably best put in an appendix because it is not really experimental data. It's certainly too long to fit in the body text and no one needs to read it, but it needs to be there as a as kind of a reference. And then there's generating power hydrogen again. Uh, I think I covered this in my quantum course at the end. Then we get to the references. And that's it. You can see because they've been manually typed, there's some random changes in font size few inconsistencies 27 references um probably all right so this kind of thing is there we go it's it's not terrible it's actually it's better than i thought it would be when i dug this out i expected this to be really embarrassing but it's not too bad it does a good straightforward way of describing what happened it really needs to use the literature better if it wants to dump itself up into a first class mark so I'm not surprised it only scored in the 60s um, and there's a little bit of logic missing in the structure assignments but apart from that it's, you know it's fine this is how they should look and how they should be uh, written I think um, certainly doesn't need too much more doing to it to really make it quite a good report um, it's alright where it is and again a lot of illustrations in it a lot of really solid figure captions. That's the kind of thing that I'm looking for. I mean, yeah, I'm biased. I was trained to write this way. So yeah, I'm gonna look for it now. But I do think there are good reasons. I think that method's really good. Right, you do what I did, what I saw, what it means, what am I gonna do next? That kind of loop through that, what, um, loop through that with your description. Um, and I think that's all I have to say about this. All right, it's a kind of solid two-one work, really.